Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar uh, on closing the loop between artificial intelligence and structured reporting. Uh, my name is Dominica Suga. I'm a cardiothoracic radiologist in Utrecht, in Netherlands. And I'm happy to have Pinar Yilmaz uh, from Rotterdam with me on my side as moderator. So today we'll be discussing the integration of AI and structured reporting into the radiologist workflow. And as we believe, these can be powerful tools that may likely improve the efficiency and accuracy in radiology if at their full potential. Um, but I also know that the integration and uh, well, integration of them into the workflow um, and their use can be very challenging. But luckily, we have two experts uh, in the field with us today, Dr. Marit Hafman and Dr. Lukas Müller from the University Medical Center in Mainz, Germany. And they will share their uh, experiences on integrating these tools in clinical practice and how to overcome these challenges with closing this so-called loop between the two. Um, I hope they will show us some great examples and will provide us with some practical solutions. Um, I also think it would be great if we would have some time for questions at the end of the webinar. So please um, drop your questions in the chat or Q&A during the talks and we will uh, discuss these afterwards. Also, thanks to Intervision for making this uh, webinar possible. And Pinar and I are very excited to hear about the integration. So let's get started. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I am Moritz Hoffman. Next to me is Lucas Miller. And um, let's start this off. So um, first up, our conflicts of interest. There's really nothing to declare. And then um, this is the outline of our talk. So when we want to talk about closing the loop, we obviously have to address what the loop is. And then taking a closer look at that loop, we have to focus on dead ends and detachments in that loop, because obviously we want to close that loop. And that suggests that there are some detachments in that loop. And for that, we're looking at key players in the loop and their needs. And then also, we don't want to leave you without any solutions. Um, so uh, hopefully we can show some practical um, implementation solutions that we have set up at our site and then uh, leave you with some input on that. So starting off with the loop, it's really three key players in there. There's AI, there's radiologists, and there's structured reporting. So typically you see a uh, narrow AI that feeds the radiologist with some kind of information that he or she can then use to, to write his report. And that can be, for example, in structured reporting. And in the best case, structured reporting then can feed back some information to the AI. But if you do use AI in clinical reality, this might be the point where you're saying, wait, but that's not really happening. That's not what we're used to seeing. How is structured reporting feeding back to the AI? And that is something that um, is completely correct because the loop really doesn't look that simple. It's a bit more complicated. So typically we see AI doing image findings, reporting those to radiologists. And then you see the first sort of challenge. The radiologist can then decide, do I use free text report, write that all up in prose, or do I use structured reporting? So that's the first sort of uh, division we see in, in our pathway. And all this in yellow is the clinical pathway of how we as radiologists use AI and structured reporting. And to sort of close that loop further, there's another pathway, which is the development pathway for AI. And that basically has to be read backwards. So if you want to develop an AI, you obviously know you need a structured and annotated database um, to learn to train that AI so it can then forward image findings. To structure that database and annotate it, you need radiologists or structured reporting to do that and then uh, feedback to the AI. But as you see, there's a yellow pathway, a clinical pathway, and the white pathway, the development pathway. So right there, there's a detachment really, because those two things are not happening simultaneously. And that brings us to the key problems, because it's really not a loop. It's rather a knot than a loop. And there are dead ends and there are detachments between those two pathways. And now the key players obviously have different needs. We've just heard uh, the AI needs some kind of ground truth and maybe the radiologist needs something different. 
And then conflicts of interest obviously arise that prevent us from closing that entire loop. So we've identified key players. It's AI, structured reporting, and the radiologist. Let's look at what they actually need and what, what we have to do. AI needs are apparently simple. It's a ground truth. So we need some kind of structured database and they need a cost-effective access to those training data sets. And really to sort of close that entire loop, we need to develop continual learning systems. Typically what we see is on the left is an offline AI system that is trained on a uh, highly structured and annotated database, which is then um, trained and then uh, used in clinical reality for a very narrow task. But really what would be nice if we synchronize those processes and then have a continual learning system, which can sort of actually use that loop and use that new feedback to generate new tasks. So if we go look at the structured reporting needs, what we have to keep in mind is that we have those two um, ways that go from the radiologist um, to free text report and structured reporting. And that's the biggest problem for structured reporting because it's just one of two options. And really, if we're honest, it's, it's right now, it's probably not the most used option compared to free text. So that's the main problem. We have to solve the under usage of structured reporting. And one way to do is something that Lucas will tell us in, in the second part of this talk. And another way would be to enable direct communication with AI. So make structured reporting um, more beneficial for the radiologist reporting. And then in the end, the radiologist, what does he or she need? He just needs less disruptive workflow integration. So we want low bars for access for AI tools and for structured reporting. We want quantification data readily available because we can quantify all we want with AI, but if we don't have that readily available for our clinical reports, it's might be nice for science, but it, might, it won't be integrated in clinical reports. And third thing is we want time saving and reporting, and obviously also at presenting at clinical conferences and multidisciplinary meetings. And for that, we need to try to close that loop to, to integrate all that, and then all the players can benefit, not only one player. So let's start off with some solutions. Um, to that to those problems. I want to show you the implementation of, of how we are implementing one of the AIs at our clinic and sort of walk you through the workflow. We start off with a CT, obviously, um, which is then simultaneously sent to the radiologist who's writing the report and to the AI. And that AI then can then feed back to the, to the radiologist. This has to be integrated in a seamless way and direct routing so that the radiologist does not have to click any buttons or anything to, to feed the AI with data, but that has to happen automatically. Only then can we have data readily, readily available. So once the radiologist then, then clicks a shortcut on his keyboard, he, can, he or she can just see these pretty basic AI tasks, like segmentation of the lungs, you can see right here. But that's not really what we're, what we're aiming for in the, in the long game. We're rather aiming for a more quantitative approach, right? And as we were scrolling through this CT, I'm sure all of you can, would have found those, uh, those nodules yourself as well. Um, but the small nodules right next to the vessels, for example, those might be more difficult. But that's not all the AI can do. The AI can also take up some tasks that we as radiologists um, find some tedious, like measuring those, uh, those nodules in two dimensions, localization of it. And then it can actually go a step further and give us a prediction of how the malignancy probability is. And then that can help us sort of look at if the AI says it's a, there's a high probability, we're going to look at that nodule a little bit closer and, and evaluate it ourselves. And then you can see it here on the bottom, it can actually start writing an AI report. And that's something that we need to integrate 
into our reports um, and integrate those two things, the AI data and our report. And that's something on how to do that is what Lucas is gonna tell you a little bit. And for a third little demonstration here, um, this is just a regular CT scan of the lung, obviously. And I think we can all appreciate at least that mass in the left lower lobe. And then there's some more small nodules as well that we would have all found and we could have all measured just fine. But we go one step ahead of that and we go through a follow-up scan with the, with the AI, we can actually measure all those and have data ready, readily available, which is the last thing um, I, that is a need for the radiologist. Um, we want clinical conferences to be more data-driven and have reliable data and quantification data to show our clinical colleagues. And if, when we click through those nodules, we can actually see on the, on the bottom right here, you can see which nodule is growing and what's the volume double time. So that feature, that nodule on the bottom here, for example, has a volume double time of 10 days. So that means that is probably, that is a growing nodule and that has a higher malignant uh, probability than, than another nodule, obviously. All right, so all this is nice, but it needs to be fed into our reporting system. So this is, where we actually start to close the loop. This is where image findings get sent directly to structured reporting, and we can actually start to, to make it more a loop. It might look more like a knot now, but in the end, I'm sure uh, it'll make sense, and we can actually close that loop. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Lucas, and he's gonna talk about solutions for structured reporting. Yes, so hello from my side again. Uh, my name is Lucas Miller. I'm one resident here at the Department of Radiology in Mainz. And you all probably know what the strengths of AI solutions are and what they can offer us as radiologists in our future work. However, I think we are at an important point now in the development of AI because we, we have many solutions that, that help to identify specific problems. They solve specific tasks, but we need to focus and how we can integrate them in our workflow. And from our point of view, as we have experience with structured reporting, we believe that the loop can be closed using structured reporting. So our aim of this talk was also to have a closer look at the state of the art in structured reporting and how we can use AI in structured reporting to improve the reports, but also to have AI image results integrated into structured reporting. So basically, you all know that there are several studies focusing on specific indications or specific imaging studies and specific modalities where the authors have shown, several groups have shown that there is a really bad benefit of structured reporting, including better readability, not only for you, but also for the referring clinicians and also your fellow radiologists. So, you can easily communicate results and therefore have also a better comparability between patients who received more than one scan and you can compare results automatically and also have a more detailed content of your reports which you can use to analyze the reports afterwards so that's clearly clearly those studies have shown many strengths of structured reporting and this is something that has also been identified by leading societies, for example, here, the uh, American College of Radiolo Radiology, but also the European Society of Radiology, with, uh, who have clearly stated that radiology reports in standardized form and structured reports are their favorite form of reports because they ensure completeness and comparability of the reports. And something that we have to keep in mind when we talk with our referring clinicians, but also with our fellow radiologists, it, that structured reports can minimize ambiguity, which helps us a lot to see the same findings in reports we read from other radiologists and um, help us to communicate also with our, with our um, referring clinicians and in conferences. And theoretically, 
structured reporting enables us to integrate more clinical parameters. And also in the future, we hope that it will help us to integrate, for example, laboratory markers directly into our reports. And this will enhance hopefully data sharing. Um, I can imagine that we can easily share our reports, for example, with pathology and have a, a together analysis of our results and of our images um, for, for, for example, um, our, our referring clinicians, but also in, in conferences we have with our referring clinicians. So that is something where structured reporting can help. And particularly, and this is one, one key point of our talk here, using AI results and integrate them into, into uh, reporting, into an integrative report that helps us to understand the case. So this is something we all know from structured reporting. Um, as, we, as we want to show you some examples, Here's one, one of, our, um, of our own department where we have yeah, quite a long experience with uh, integrating structured reporting in clinical routine. We have therefore here an in-house developed, uh, developed MREE-based um, open source reporting platform, which has obviously a low bar accessibility for us here as clinicians and is fully integrated in our PACS and RISC. And this helped us a lot to build a large data structured uh, reports data bank um, for several indications. So that this was the original publication here in 2015. 15, and since then we have connect, uh, collected our data. Um, as you can see here, for specific indications where we use structured reporting, the numbers have continuously increased over the years. And we have now a yeah, proportion of structured reports for this indication is in around 80% where, where we have those reports available. Um, but more important than those rising numbers where we, where we now is that over the time we asked our radiologists, radiology colleagues, but also our referent physicians, how they see structured reports compared to free text reports in their clinical routine since integration seven years ago. When we started that thing. So what we can see basically here down in the left, we see that not only radiologists, but also referring physicians favor structured reports for their clinical practice. And this is mainly, as you can see here on the right side, due to the completeness of the reports, their clearness, but also the extraction of relevant information, not only for radiologists when they read previous reports, but also for the referring physicians. And this facilitates a more fast decision making, not only for us, but also our colleagues. And um, as a benefit of all that, it also enables a structured report as you can easily find cases with specific, within specific indications or modalities, and you have easily the extracted information within a data bank. However, structured reporting at this point cannot be the overwhelming solution for any of our problems we have with reporting. So the ACR saw clearly and very early that there has to be initiatives that lead to more structured reporting in clinical routine. We need more experience with those models and we have to address specific problems um, that structured reports have compared to free text reports. And from our point of view, the most important problem that structured reports or structured reporting has in our workflow is that as a radiologist, we have really have to focus on the report. So we have to, to have the keyboard in our hand, we have the mouse in our hand, and we have always to look at a second screen um, where we have the boxes we have to fill in. Um, and our dictating is, quite okay, but it also needs some filling in and you have to click the right box. Though there is a problem actually, and this is the look away problem. We always have to look away and not just as in free text reports, have our mic in the hand and look at the images, call through our scans and directly dictate into our reporting system. So this, this look away problem is something that exists in structured reporting. And as one initiative we here in minds thought it could be a solution when we use natural language processing as one AI form to convert our free text reports and combine the best of both words. So we, we can do 
reporting using our MIG, viewing at our images, as you can see here. We report in our text, and after what, this text is directly converted into a structured report, which we hope enables efficient and high quality reporting. But not only that, we also thought in our Diamet project of having a chatbot that asks you questions and we, we could show in a use case of early PSs that this works quite well. So if you forget something in your free text report, this AI solution helps you to spot the missing points and fill the, use the use the terms suggested for you to fill these fill these empty spots to have like a complete structured report. So in this case, this solution helps us to combine the best of both worlds. And we think especially for young colleagues starting to report on, on specific findings, but also for your own uh, quality management, something like that could be very helpful to have like a complete report in a structured form for referring clinicians, but you can always just really have the mic in the hand, focus on the images and we thought that this would be one solution to, um, to yeah, solve the look away problem. So this is from our point of view, something where we can directly use image findings integrated in SR and do like a complete pathway where we favor more the structured reporting than the free text report. Another solution on the same topic, I think, is when we look at a recent study on ChatGPT4. So you, you all know, know the discussions in the media and yeah, the potential they see in this solution, but actually we in radiology have now also our first experiences and something you can think of is um, what the colleagues around uh, Lisa Adams from Charité and uh, colleagues from Stanford did actually when they used ChatGPT for converting free text reports into structured reports. So what the colleagues basically did is they had a list of templates they used in GPT-4. And um, in a first step, they had give, got, gave GPT-4 the unstructured report, the solution then looked for the suitable list in the, uh, for the suitable template in the list available, and then converted um, in the next step this free text report into this template, which worked quite well in the study, but actually has from our point of view, some weaknesses as well, for example, about data sharing and things like that. We have to discuss in the future, but in the first example, this works really well for them. So yeah, it's a very interesting study on that topic and could also help us to use more structured reports in our routine and for more indications. So, this is something we can we or the, this is anything we can do about structured reporting. However, I think a, another rather old problem a problem that not only comes with structured reporting but also with report re, retrax reports is how can we integrate image findings? And in a later step, this will also be part of how can we integrate AI results in our reports. So, what we can do actually is when we use more structured reports, we can automatically read, for example, like table position and sizes and use AI to find those images in our scan. So we can do that way around. However, what we need more when we talk about integrating AI as well as images, we need to integrate our results directly in the reporting system. And what we can here see is from the um, on, in on imaging AI in practice, that we have to use AI results, look at them in our viewer, review AI results and report them in our, in our study. And only then we can fully use this information. So as Maud says, not only, not only um, from, the, from Imbality, the results go directly to the AI, but also to the radiologist and all should be integrated in one system. When MINDS started, as you can see, we have some AI solutions working here. And we started using, um, using pipelines based, mainly based on DICOMs to integrate those results with, uh, with our own developed structured reporting system and then convert them in our risk into real reports where we combine those informations. At the end, we think that 
either GPT-4 or other solutions will help to close the loop finally. And um, as you can see here, create with our structured report structured databases that can be used as Maud said, to train AI solutions, to further develop AI solutions, to make them better for us in our workflow. However, the loop is closed, but we have some points radiologists have to have to admit and we should be open-minded for our results, of course. We should always be open-minded to, to new things, but especially for integrating AI results in our reports. And in the next step, we also could think about integrating, for example, lab results, histology, pathology, uh, other clinical parameters into our reports and have like a more integrative radiology report. But a main point of that, and this is something that comes with in the loop as an extra point is we have to have a look at explainable AI results. Actually, something like heat maps, but also other solutions on explainable AI will help to gain more trust in our solutions. However, we should not have too much hope that it will um, that we will reach complete acceptance of AI solutions into uh, into our reports. We should think about more validation of AI. You all know that problems, and we can discuss them now. And where we think that the acceptance for AI solutions will further grow and we will can or we can then automatically integrate them. And what is actually the loop looking like, like at the end from our point of view as a clinical radiologist, we also think that there should always be this feedback back to the radiologist, what the AI saw, what the AI find, and how we can use those things in our reports. And actually, this is something where we would like to end. We would like to discuss with you how you imagine the radiology report of the future and how we can, how we can continue from that. So from our point, thank you very much. And we're very looking forward to your questions and for a nice discussion. Thank you very much for this great overview. Uh, both of you, it was very clear. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion actually. Um, so we can start with the first question in the Q&A box. Marcus Sabine asked, you outlined the benefits of using structured reporting for the AI database and transforming natural speed into structured reporting. However, as I understand it, the database would not need to image and position to which a passage in the report refers. How would this be created in a scenario in which the structured reported is generated from the speech? Thank you for the question. Um, so, as I understand it, um, the question refers to um, the problem Lucas addressed um, that we want to feed key images into the report. Uh, is that right? And um, okay, thank you. Um, the that is a two-folded question. I think. Um, I mean, for the report, it is uh, rather easy. You can. Um, do that as well as Lucas said by um, taking out the the slice number or table position of the CT scan and, and have the image reference in that. Um, the annotation, on the other hand, um, which then uh, trains the AI, um, is obviously a more difficult problem. But an annotation of images will then again be easier if you have structured information to do so. So it's sort of a um, the clinical one is an easy solvable one. The training one is obviously one that, that uh, needs more work on it. If that answers the question. So there's a follow up, but where does the key image information come from in a dictation? Well, you would have to dictate it um, in, into the system. For example, like if you if we, if we stay at the Eurothylus um, use case, um, where you dictate and then um, then the NLP populates the structure report. You could say um, on the left kidney there is a uh, um, there's two stones or whatever, and then you would actually have to dictate where the left kidney is on what table position. Um, obviously, it would be great if the AI could recognize that, and AI can obviously recognize where the kidney is in the in the scan, and we we have a system, for example, that does a volumetry of, of our kidneys for every scan, and does so the AI should know where the kidney is, 
but that's something that also needs to be brought together, which is, I think, a problem of the couple of having a couple of AIs which have very narrow tasks and not communicate with with each other. And then that is something I think that can be aided by structured reporting because we provide that platform for those AIs to talk to in a common language, which is DICOM. And would you see it as also because it's integrated then you to have it as headings as well? You know, you because you also mentioned about including other things, right? So that's obviously in the future with the lab work and the pathology work. Mm -hmm. So we could think perhaps of within our work as we have the text, but also headings in which we can just go through the images. Right. And I mean, uh, it's really, um, when we look at um, stuff like enterprise image platforms, it's really not that far in the future to see the, that you can have pathology images and radiology images in the same packs. Mm -hmm. So why not think a step further and then just do the thing that's that's just the logical consequence of that and integrate both into one report because I think that is something that adds value not only to the clinician, but also if you look at the feedback that Lucas was talking about, because when I do a report on, on a prostate exam, I want to know what the histology said in the end because I can learn from that and I can improve my work, obviously. And if I can have that feedback loop like, like that as well, that'd be great. Yeah, I know, and especially within, with the urology as a, a specialty, I know they're very into this matter to integrating all of it and even prediction, right? So um, let's go further with the next question. Uh, Robert Rieschen uh, asks, regarding my vision on the future radiology report, it would demand, depend on the time frame. Uh, and he goes, Wale, Wale, et al. Uh, gave a nice overview on levels of autonomous radiology in interactive journal of medical research based on autonomous driving. Optimally, we would, we would someday end up at a mostly autonomous diagnostic process. Right. Um, I think that's that. Um, that's something that is a long way ahead. Um, and I think we we would like to see uh, continuous learning, but that doesn't mean that it can spiral out of control. There. That's why there are three key players, or at least two key players. The radiologist is always in that loop as well, and um, that's our job to supervise it and and see that it stays explainable and does not suddenly spiral out and, and does something completely different. And that's what we see in in the in something some of the developments that we see right now. Sometimes they continue to to learn something, but it's not really for the better. So actually actually when when I hear this question, I always think of how the job will change actually and this continues with reporting because I think we would I, I always compare it with like pilots. I think nobody would go into a plane knowing that there are no pilots or, or a few people only. But actually today planes can automatically start in large airports. They can fly using, using a autopilot and it can also automatically land. And I think this is where radiologists will, will find their place actually as a pilot managing complex systems. We cannot, we can, we can overview as a human, but we cannot extract all structured data or all quantitative data imaging offers for us. So we, be, we become more like moderators and also like system, the system engineers uh, managing all those, all those um, complex tasks, I think. So actually I saw another question from Mart Rentz. Yeah, Rentz, I hope that's correct. So um, you said, you mentioned the loop feedback from reports back to the algorithm keep, to keep learning. What about reproducibility? One of the most difficult part of making a useful act uh, algorithm is, yes, if I understand correctly, Mark, I completely agree with you that this is actually the most weakest point of our whole loop. I think to have high qualitative data which enables reproducibility of specific results is something that depends strongly not only on the image quality, but also 
on the quality of our reports. And we strongly believe that structured reporting will help to like have more specific data, which focus on specific points, which is hard, hard to extract from free trades reports, for example. But this is actually something we have to think for all AI solutions about. We have to think how can we validate our results. So we could have whole have a whole another webinar of talking how to integrate integrate uh, AI solutions, how to have like generatability and something like that. But we believe that structured reporting helps us a lot, and this is something we would like to have as a key point to like have structured data which will help to uh, solve many, hopefully some of the problems we have with. AI actually today by integrating them in our reports. Yeah, thank you. Great uh, comment, by the way, on the helicopter view. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just think uh, uh, of it like that and the role of us. And that brings actually uh, in mind the question I had with what you did. So the structured reporting, how, uh, because of the great paper you wrote, right? Um, there are a few. Uh, image modalities uh, which you chose uh, to use uh, as a structured report. Um, my question is, how was it built? Was it like tick boxes and like an other uh, field? Because this is something, I mean, uh, this pops up as uh, a topic as well in the clinics, right? And uh, one of the great things that structured report thing could help with next to that it's um, structured for not only us but for the uh, physicians for uh, time saving for data storage for education for science uh, we can mention a lot of things but the thing that comes back is is it really time saving and for which subspecialties is it useful because if you have a very uh, difficult head and neck MRI and you see a lot of other things uh, that you want to mention or obviously the exclusive things um, then you have to get all those out of your other fields <laughs> to make it structured again exactly that's that's the main problem we have with structured reporting for for, for complex for complex imaging studies as you said well our approach is actually very clinical driven mm -hmm. so Whenever we think, well, we would be web faster in this indication with a structured report, then we have like, okay, then have it, then then create a structured report, and we will have a look at in our crew edit, and we'll have to have to look if it's really fast and works for us. But also, as you said, from our clinicians, we have the experience, for example, with our urologists who really like our structured reports and came now back to us and say, well, let's do some research together on that. We we, we like your structured reports. We also give them like an image annotation, like a PDF where they can see where the stones are, which density have the stones, which size and something like that. So I think this helps them a lot. But as you said, complexity is always the thing with structured reporting. And this is, yeah. And we have data on the time saving because that's one thing of, uh, I mean, if you're a radiologist, experienced radiologist, does it really add, like add up? Do you ha have, time saved for things that you can just click with like it's normal uh, next yeah actually we have we have looked at trauma scans in one study which which i showed as as one screenshot where the significantly um saved time reading the scans and this especially also for 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 um people who are not so experienced in reading trauma scans this is something like for example, when you also evaluate, evaluate like several AI tools, for example, I think especially for for younger radiologists, it helps a lot to have like a structured form where you can look at. And this is where we actually saw significant time savings. I this that. Actually, we looked at one we looked at one problem. So at, at at trauma scans, and this is also one problem. Structured reporting we have. There are many studies spoken focusing on specific indications however we we have to get more like the general overview and this is coming with <laughs> complex scans this comes with time saving in specific investigations so i think this is I where agree. we are in the race now yeah. 
I think there's side notes for everything, right? I mean, if, what you say with um, have it structured, it's uh, on the one hand, it could be good for uh, have um, getting experience in, within the education or the residency. But on the other hand, it's also um, being lazy or you have already have a structured report. So uh, I'll just pick uh, the things that are already on the list, right? And if there's something, something abnormal again, uh, then... But I mean, that's something you can also um, solve from a technical side or at least aid in solving it um, when you use pre-populated fields, for example. Like yeah. if it's a totally normal scan and you can just hit OK on the bottom and it says and every field is already pre-populated with normal. Or, uh, no, that's what I ask if it's like ticking boxes because that's something that, I mean, that's feedback yeah. Within the that, that is something that, that I think uh, actually takes quite some effort is um, to develop a template. And obviously there are there are quite good um, templates um, from from different uh, from different organizations, but you really need to use them and put them to work, and then you can you you actually face those problems. Like okay, but I see twenty percent of scans are normal scans, and I don't want to tick normal every time. So then you come up with these solutions and do uh, do pre-populated uh, text boxes, for example. And that that really makes usability so much better. Yeah, yes, with, and, with regard to the time saving, I was actually also surprised uh, in your paper because you reported the uh, use of stank reporting for the fast echo. Mm -hmm. so is that also just a box you tick if it's like normal? Right, if it's normal, it's just one like box. The quickest report I make, right? There's no free fluid uh, done. Right? Yeah. yeah. And um, I was also surprised, like the total body scans or trauma scans, um, they can be quite complex, right? Or um, there's every time there's something else you find. Um, but I can imagine you can also save a lot of time if you use it in oncology, right? Because as you know, like the amount of exams we use are there made this increasing, but also these interdisciplinary meetings, right? So we have more and more meetings and every time someone else is doing these meetings and then you again have to go into the report, go into the image, you do the TNM staging. And I was actually surprised that it wasn't as much as described in your paper that you use it a lot in oncology because when it's a TNM staging or other oncology scan, you just open it and it's like ready, right? You can save a lot of hours of work, I'd say. Actually, this is something we work on, but however, it turned out to be more complex to create those templates, like for example, like the trauma scan. We did not imagine this at the beginning of our thoughts because uh, we thought also, yeah, it would be easy to integrate it. But however, what we actually now working on is to have like more modules. So you use like, for example, for one, two more entity, you can use, um, for example, like thoracic module and integrate it or abdominal module. So we now want to or try to work on a more model space feed because if you have to choose like a template for every tumor you have, it would become, yeah. Very, very hard to design them all and to, to have like specific features, like for example, in esophageal carcinoma or in pancreatic carcinoma, you have to focus on many specific points and this is something we work on. Yeah, I think that's actually very interesting because you have the experience, right? And these are the things that maybe we don't think about if we haven't used it before because you say, oh, just do the staging and we're done or just click, oh, pancreatic tumor and you get the pop-off for like, Think there's a difference in standardized and structured reporting right if you standardize terms or structures um, but it sounds like um, obvious right if you see lesions click and it's done but apparently you uh, experience these challenges so that's very interesting and i think uh, that is also a, a question of how how standardized is your is your your problem like in if there's 10 different tumor entities then there might be 10 different um, standardizations but something where we um, have implemented it and it's used almost exclusively in structured reporting is uh, evaluation for a liver transplant. And um, that is very standardized and therefore that is the perfect example of how you can do it. And then that's the clinicians, um, they need that standardized report from us in order to list someone for liver transplantation. And um, that works really well for us. But Obviously, that is one use case, again, that is pretty narrow. And what about differences within uh, technical uh, the technical part, like protocols, et cetera? Because I can imagine, right, if you're within one clinic, okay, 
do standard things, but not every clinic does the same thing. What are your thoughts on that? Like, is maybe it's a very general question to think of, uh, are we going to have standard templates just per clinic or are we going to have it general per country per actually i think one question uh, or two to one question robin robin handel asked um when he when he asked wouldn't as rpac require ce fda marking if yes how would you think that would work with multiple ai algorithms wouldn't we need approval for each algorithm so something um, we do in germany or we have from our german society of radiology we have like solutions or structured reports. Of course, you can use them, you, you have to adapt them, but they work quite well. And I think we need data from many countries. We need to work all together on our structured reports, like see where are the problems. Like for example, how does it work with different scanners, with different protocols? How do we fit them in, into structured reports? Like for example, we minds have a field where we can put the scanner, put the medication we gave, for example, in, in uh, cardiac CT, coronary CT, um, but I think yeah we need we need initiatives from our societies working together to iteratively work on our templates. And I think when you can download them for your institution because they are approved by by societies, I actually don't think you need a CE certification anymore. So when they're validated by by the societies, I think you can use them because it's part of your reporting and not of your of your actual of your actual scanning, for example. Um, and I think another one is if we say we would need CE certification or FDA marking, um, how would that work with AI algorithms? Well, actually, I think, and this is something we do here in Minds, we contact our partners, like for example, InfoVision. We contact them and ask if it's possible to integrate the AI results into our structured reporting. So we have to work with the providers of the solutions. And yeah, this comes to the next problem. We have many AI solutions for specific topics and so on and so on. So that you have to, you would have to work with many providers. And probably there is something when we work with more platform models and modules, probably this will help us also to integrate results in structured reporting. So there is a lot of work to do and I'm very looking forward to that. But really, um, I think what helps in that a lot is that we, at least we speak the same language, right? We speak like a, or the well, format is the same. And do we know, speak the same talk. language? Because um, this morning during the lecture, we had a, well, it was on PET CT and about prominent lymph nodes, right? Some radiologists like to use it if it's uh, not a too big lymph node, but you want to mention it because it's not abnormal, but it's also not quite normal. So are we going to redefine some of, some of the language that we already use? I think that's where the standardized uh, comes in, right? Not the structured. And I don't know if you're like, we have this lexicon in Utrecht also, right? It gives the percentage of like, how sure are you about this finding? I think that already helps because even between colleagues, there's so much miscommunication. You think you know what he means, which we know in all situations in life, we miscommunicate all the time. Yeah, actually, this is something we use at the bottom of our structured reports as well, like how safe are you, like 90%, 70%, 50%. So we also use this system. I think you're completely right. We need we need something to that in our in our communication. But this is actually something where also free text reports start to become straggling, like swelling around when the radiologist is not specific, specifically saying what he wants to say, and he's like swelling around. And this not this does not help us as fellow radiologists, but also helps not our uh, our referring clinicians. But don't we sometimes stay a bit vague to give the physician a bit of like space to decide if he does or does not want to act on this finding? Because I think we also have like some freedom to think. It, this patient, I mean, maybe he's 89, he doesn't need to go and follow up from some uh, cystic uh, pancreatic lesion, right? He will get into this flow chart, have like uh, MRIs all the time. It doesn't make sense, right? What is the chance uh, that it will be malignant at some point in his life? But I think that's, we something that that? We, that's something that needs to be discussed interdisciplinary, right? And that's, I don't think um, it, it should be the radiologist saying, okay, um, I don't want to like, 
force someone into a decision, that's fine, but then talk to each other and, and, and find a decision in consensus. And um, there's, we, I mean, structured reporting really makes you um, be more decisive, I guess. Um, and it, it forces you to make a decision and, and, and use more decisive language. But that also means that we need to uh, be more integrated in the decision process and, and integrate other uh, disciplines in our decision process. And that's why we need the integration of, for example, lab values or histology, or because then you can actually make an informed decision together with everyone. And that's sort of, I think, where, the, where we're headed. Yeah. Another interesting question, uh, using a useful set of date, uh, data for learning, I guess, uh, when you feed your own data back, doesn't it generate a bias and will it stop functioning as it should? Bias is always interesting in AI because <laughs> we don't really know, right? <laughs> and that's, yeah, and that's something that, that Lucas uh, addressed um, with the explainable AI thing. And I think we are, um, we, typically see heat maps of, of what the AI is looking at, but we see the area it's looking at, but we don't necessarily see what it was looking at, at the, in that area, right? And um, then of course, that is something that, that can happen. If we feed it our own language, it will learn on that and it, it might introduce bias, obviously, yes. And that is something that, that needs to be addressed by some supervision. And, Honestly, we don't know how to do that yet completely because we're there has to be some supervision, but also there there has to be a continual learning system. That that is that is an open question. And actually, what we have to think about is that from our local loop we built here, we should think about more. And this is also a complete topic in AI at the moment. I think about the generalization. How can we validate our results? How sure are we? For example. When we look at the numbers of um, companies publishing their original results in original studies, um, in scientific studies, where we can read them, this is only a small proportion. Many of them do not do right external validation, and it would also be the case in our in our in our own solution when we just feed all the um, bias data, for example, and even enhance the bias because we continuously feed the AI with our bias data. So. We need some feedback loop, not only internally, where we have to look at each report again from, from consultant side, for example, or do like have a look at some at the 10th report, for example, but we also have like a feedback loop from other institutions or from bigger data banks. So I think one point we should all work together on is creating data banks where we can test our AI solutions, where we can validate them and even rethink them afterwards and improve them. Um, a next question, an interesting one. Uh, how can we leverage a GPT-4 for post hoc transformation without compromising patient privacy? And this is actually something that is unanswered in, these, in this first radiology paper because they used like, um, yeah, fictional fictional um, reports. So this this were not real report uh, reports from from a patient. So I think this will uh, all the authors need to need to have a follow up and uh, should explain how they how they can do it with um, with yeah worrying the patient's privacy actually. And then uh, a last one, uh, Sina Rossi. Thank you for your practical. Lecture, is there any place in this cycle for futures that an AI tool can detect, but not a radiologist, for instance, an abnormal texture feature in the liver suspicious for metastasis, which may not be detected easily by human eye? Of course, yeah. Um, I mean, that's something uh, that's basically the very uh, the very nature of, of AI that it, it or what it was supposed to be doing in the first place is helping us find stuff that we can find or that is hard to find. And um, is it either the liver or the lung, it doesn't matter, um, but it has to be fed into the report, but also fed back to the radiologist, right? And then the radiologist um, has to have the decision over, okay, is that something or is that, or is that something that I don't think that's real, that might be an artifact or whatever. 
And what can help with that is like, if it, the AI feeds back like a, a um, probability um, that sort of gets more explainable in that, that it gives you back a, a percentage that it says, okay, I'm this certain, just like we are doing in the report, the AI should also do it and says, okay, I'm this percent certain, this is a bad lesion, go have a look at it. And um, I think, so it's both the feedback loop to the radiologist, but also um, the loop to the image. Great, thank you. Um, so you gave a great overview uh, and it was a great discussion. Uh, you showed us how things were implemented um, with, uh, within your institution. So obviously we know what your opinions are. And I was wondering, what are your practical advices to move on forward for the rest of us? So how should we get started? And what do you think is feasible on like a short, in the near future? Like how do you see structured reporting? I'm, going to, I'm just gonna start off. Um, I think um, what is feasible if, if there's nothing implemented yet um, is then really take some use case and start narrow and then then go go into the depth of it really but if you we started off with the urolithiasis case for example which is very structured and very easy to to understand and we're still working on that template so um that is a continual process but you have to start somewhere and i think um use a an easy case that all has a structured question which is, for example, you will apply this, it's pulmonary embolism, for example, it's rather a yes, no report, and then some side findings with that. And that can really ease you into the topic of it. And then you can start seeing, okay, this needs to be changed, this needs to be changed, and then sort of develop your, your own templates from that. And something that is a very good place to start for that is templates that are provided by, by international societies. And I think something I can add on that excellent answer from Moritz. Um, I think you should be close with your IT department. You like work close together with them on integrating those solutions into the risk so that a fellow radiologist will, will use them, not only you who are convinced from search and reporting, but also the most unconvinced one should think, well, search and reporting helps me a lot in this uh, solution and actually what comes with that is, and that is what we are currently doing, is like, how cool would it be if we have like a report from us, but also from AI, AI down below, we refute, but we have like quantitative data and we have like our qualitative report, how cool would that be? And to see or to communicate with the referring physicians is then a great experience where they, where they say, well, this has no impact on my clinical decision. Or they say, well, this is great for us because we can then easily decide da, 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 and also residents can easily decide on that and that and the key images help us to perform that and that. So I think this is, yeah, where it helps to yeah, work in groups with all, all those people. And, and getting closer, right? I totally agree with you. Easy indications and then, and, yeah. And with the interdisciplinary disciplinary meetings. Oh, wow. Yeah. Exactly. Do you actually think you are uh, um, impacted if you use AI um, if they uh, assign something incorrectly? Because maybe you read also the report of the breast uh, study that if the AI assigns an incorrect uh, BIRAD score, right, that you are less likely to change it. Do you think this will impact the residents in training or well, us? Yeah, well, we, we saw that uh, study uh, from, from Cologne Group and um, we saw the we saw the results for all. I, I think an interesting part was not, it was for all like all groups like consultants, residents, and so on. Um, and it's actually it is something that impacts our work. Um, I think we we all have to think clearly about that if we open like a scan, look at the lung nodules, and have the AI saying, "Well, this is not likely to be a malignancy." we have to strongly think about each argument to say, well, we think it is one. So we come with all those, we come with all those arguments um, regarding AI 
and so on. And uh, yeah, this is something. And we already have that, right? In some yeah. institutions, we already have uh, software helping us with long yeah, articles. Exactly. And, and it's so it, hard. Click <laughs> it on and off to see if you're, yeah, exactly. if you agree and with it. So. How this impacts us. But I think that, that that's not a new problem, right? It's just it's yes. confirmation by it. And it's something that probably if you're, you're a consultant, you see every day if someone um, they sends you a scan to review and you believe, okay, that's that's a fairly good guy. He's, he's doing a good job, probably right, was he saying. Then you're going to be... AI, as you say, it's also... No, I think, but you just have to stay on top of it, right? The more algorithms you implement, you just have to really be aware of, was this the same protocol? Was it a contrast enhanced, non-con scan? Is it different kernel, different mono E-level? You know, you have to just... Yeah. That's the interesting part of what I already mentioned before, the technical, the protocol parts. Yeah, there are a lot of facets. I mean, there are a lot of uh, things I think that we should uh, take into account with the language, subspecialty, scan, uh, modality. Um, I think it's already, we are over uh, time. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas and uh, Maurits. It was a great uh, session. Uh, thank you, of course, InfraVision to sponsor this webinar. And I have two more announcements. Uh, obviously, thank you all uh, who attended and who are going to watch this uh, great webinar again. Um, our next webinar will be uh, with Osimis on the 31st of May. And uh, please be reminded that our Yosomi annual meeting this year will be in Pisa on the 13th and 14th of October. And we hope to see you all there. Thank you, everyone. Um, see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.